episode of Surviving the Survivor, we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime and uh, i've got some uh, amazing guests today to continue to talk about this very disturbing case out of orlando florida two weeks ago a 13 year old madeline maddie soto she disappeared prompting a statewide uh, missing child alert officials sadly confirmed her body was later found in rural osceola county uh, just days after she was first reported missing Stefan Stearns, uh, Jennifer Soto, the mother's boyfriend, uh, is now the prime suspect in Madeline's disappearance. He's also accused of moving her body in the morning hours of Monday, February 26th, after killing her reportedly in Kissimmee. Uh, that is all according to the Orange County Sheriff's Office, uh, the medical examiner's office working to determine uh, her cause of death and manner and all of those things. And we are still waiting to hear uh, about all that. But uh, more news today. I uh, predicted this last night, and here we are. Um, Stefan Stearns slapped with a slew of new charges, which we'll get into uh, in, in just a moment. But uh, first, best guest returning to the show after his debut Detective David Nutting, he is a retired cold case supervisor, uh, served time in both Orange and Volusia counties uh, in Orlando. Uh, he now works for the amazing company Othram, but uh, has done it all as an investigator. Don't say serve well. time. Don't say I didn't mean to serve time. time. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the wrong. I was looking at oh, Stefan Stearns. Uh, I was looking at his name. So uh, gave his service. Did his service. Yeah, How about there that? Yeah. Uh, there we go. So uh, <laughs> forgive the uh, the improper use of the uh, the wording there. <laughs> Next up, correcting me as a criminal defense attorney does, is famed Tallahassee criminal defense attorney R. Timothy Jansen, a partner in the firm Jansen and Davis. Uh, he's handled complex civil administrative and criminal litigation. He also spent five years as a federal prosecutor and deep, Deepak Penaseti is going to join us. I believe he's set to join us. He's not here yet. He is uh, serving as the first ever chief innovation and medical officer of the Child Center of New York. He is a board certified psychiatrist from the Mount Sinai Hospital triple board program. He is a child psychologist, uh, psychiatrist. Uh, and works with children and uh, parents as well. And uh, he is supposed to be joining. Uh, he did say he had a couple of meetings, so I assume he is running behind. And uh, hopefully the COE will pop him in uh, once he gets here. Um, don't forget, you can now uh, get uh, custom inscriptions from CARM at signedsurvivorbook.com. That is signedsurvivorbook.com. And, of course, the book itself is out on Amazon for pre-orders right now. Um, so, David, we'll get into the uh, the breakdown of what these new charges are, but 60 new charges filed against mm -hmm. Stefan Stearns. Uh, any surprise to you? It's a large number. Um, what was your reaction to hearing this? Well, I took a look at the the charges and uh, that you know he's just charged with, and then I think last time we talked, there was some indication that this abuse had been going on for some time. So uh, it's interesting that of the 13 counts of sexual battery that were charged today, eight counts were of uh, sexual battery in a child under 12, and then five counts were on a child between 12 and 18. So it looks like it's pretty it, it, that these charge that these charges were in fact, or this abuse was in fact going on at least when she was 11 and into the age 12. So, um, you know, I don't know how they were able to determine probably from the, the time stamps on the, on the evidence that they obtained to, to say if she was victimized or he was victimizing somebody, um, you know, when they were under 12 and as well as over 12 or 12 mm -hmm. and over rather. Yeah. And then, uh, 
right here, you see uh, the breakdown here. So police say that they found additional images and video showing these criminal acts. Uh, you see Stefan Stearns on the right in his paper mache uh, prison jumpsuit. So he can't unalive himself. Uh, it's a good chance that guy will never see the light of day again. Uh, 60 new charges include Tim Jansen, eight counts of sexual battery on a child under 12, five counts of sexual battery on a child 12 to 18 years old, seven counts of lewd and lascivious molestation, 40 counts of unlawful possession of materials depicting sexual performance by a child 10 uh, or more. Uh, Tim Jansen, uh, when you see these, uh, there's Windsor. Hey, Windsor. Windsor. Say hello to everybody, Windsor. Windsor. God knows we need a therapy dog to get through this story. So, it's like uh, therapy dog. I'm I'm glad that uh, Windsor is here <laughs> to uh, calm to calm the crowd, to calm, calm SDS Nation. But Tim Jansen, when you look at 60 charges, um, yeah. is there reason to believe? And uh, I am uh, I'm just a viewer here. Is there reason to believe that this is related to more than just Madeline Soto, or there's no way to know that right now. Could this all be related to just Madeline? I would think it's only Mad Mad Madeline yeah. because they wouldn't have been able to determine the age, date of birth by the picture alone on the phone. Probably that means they would have had to gone out and interviewed and identified the girl, talked to the parents. So what they did is they went, they did a download of the phone. And they either, and I don't think the wife is talking. Maybe she has a lawyer. So I don't think she has said, oh, this is when we were at this house and that house. So I think it's all um, by the phone. And they're date stamping it by her birthday, by the dates they appeared on the phone. That's probably why you have under 12. It occurred prior to her 12th birthday. And then you have five after her 12th birthday. And then they threw in the lewd and lascivious conduct, which is a lesser included offense. Um, it could be other things showing may not be intercourse could be some other sexual nature. And then the 40 counts of uh, pictures, he has at least 40 pictures of material depicting a child, 10 or more perfor performance of a 10 child, 10 or more. So they have 40 pictures. I would take it that they charge every picture that they had. Um, so, okay. Um, that's, uh, very disturbing news to know that he had all these photos um, on there. Tracy Artman here. Um, I heard her mom got a lawyer. We'll get back to that. But the comment before that, I was just looking at David said, I feel really bad for the uh, first responders, law enforcement detectives, whoever was uh, tasked with looking through that phone. Um, from your perspective as a former homicide detective, and I've talked about this with other guys, you, you can't unsee certain things. How difficult a case is this for the investigators working it right now, especially those who have to look at these uh, horrific images on that cell phone? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, this it's job is not for everybody. That's, that's for sure. Um, you know, the, the people that are successful in child sex crimes investigations, homicide, where you're exposed to this, the, the worst of the worst, uh, on a regular basis, you these people really have to have the ability to compartmentalize what they see and then to pivot to come home and deal with normal everyday, you know, paying your bills and going to the kids' uh, soccer games. And, and, uh, it's just you, you almost live two parallel lives. And if you, if you can't compartmentalize the horrific things you see, it, it it's really, it's just, it's just not for you. And, and, you know, you know, early on in your career, if you're cut out for um, child sexual battery investigations or homicide, you, you'll, you'll know that pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. It takes a certain kind of metal M E T T L E to deal with that. Uh, Dr. Penicetti, can you hear us? Okay. Yes, I can. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, perfect. Yes. Please meet Tim Jansen, criminal defense attorney in the checkered shirt and retired homicide detective from Orlando, David Nutting in the uh, light brown jacket. And uh, glad to have you here, especially uh, for this question, Dr. Penistetti. I've, I, I introduced your bio uh, at the top of the show, but um, Annie Kay, one of our viewers, says, this case shows us that we all need to be aware of children, ours and others, so someone who feels there's something wrong can speak up on their behalf. If you see something, 
say something. You know, I was in New York after 9-11 and those signs are everywhere. Uh, if you see something, say something. Do we have to be mindful not only of our own children? I have three, but keep an eye on other kids as well. Look for some sort of odd behavior uh, in case they're, uh, you know, God forbid something is, you know, they're a, a victim of some sort of, uh, you know, abuse or assault. I think that's a tremendous point. And, you know, there's a reason there's a saying, right? It takes a village. Um, I think this is perhaps one of those reasons. It takes vigilance. But, you know, I wish it was that simple uh, because, unfortunately, we can sometimes see something, say something, and nothing gets done. And the amount of times, you know, first of all, my, my heart goes out to the family, um, everyone who's affected. And when it becomes something that is happening in the community, guess what? Now the community... Um, probably had been affected to, to, to her point, but um, now it's, it's a situation where we have to process that and make sure that we prevent it the best that we can. Um, so I think it's, it's easier said than done um, to see something, say something, but I believe that we see this way too often, way too much. It's, it's strike, it's striking how often this is happening. And I'm sure um, the experts on the panel uh, who are investigating these things, trying to make sure that these things don't happen, um, probably grown frustrated, you know, and, and society has grown frustrated. Um, but yeah, there, there's certain things that we can advise. And I think that we need to start implementing them. Um, um, you know, and some of them are just kind of like techniques, if you will, that can be implemented in the home. We, we don't want to wait until these things happen and then, hey, call a child psychiatrist. Uh, what do we do? Um, and to the point of that message, yes, people have a sense of things. And guess what? Kids have the best. They've got spidey sense. They can tell when something's a little off. So picking up on those cues, I guess the question is, what do you do next? Um, so I don't want to overtake, but you know, I'll, I'll come in when we ask. About yeah, these are these, these are all great points. I'm going to weave in a lot of questions for Dr. Penasetti. We're going to really look at the investigation, go through a timeline today that the COE helped put together. But I uh, got plenty of questions uh, for Dr. Penasetti, not only about children, but also about the you know the prime suspect in this case, as well as. Um, the mother, Jennifer Soto, Tim Jant, by the way, Ashley gifted 10 surviving and survivor memberships. Uh, thank you so much, Tim Jansen. There was a comment up just before this, uh, that the mother has now lawyered up, uh, mm -hmm. no surprise to you. I imagine. No, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, they probably can charge her with child abuse. They can charge her with con co-conspirator, um, anything else that they can possibly charge her with. Um, it's curious the photos when the photos were taken. If they take the wife's phone, the mother's phone, and find out where the mother was located at the time these pictures were taken, that can also lead to um, possible charges against the mom. Mm -hmm. Technology uh, really has changed and, and helps law enforcement a, a great deal um, in these type of investigations. Yeah. Tim, this one's for you, too, and it's also for uh, Dr. Penasetti. Uh, for the panel... Uh, Tim, if the wife, she's not the wife, she's a girlfriend, Jennifer Soto, if she knows something and the mom, but has been, it's police investigate and find out that she herself has been abused or manipulated by Stefan Stearns, uh, Tim Jansen, what does the law say about that? Is she still, um, if she, let's say hypo, just hypothetically, she's filming um, or she's there when this is happening, is she still an accomplice according to the law? I, I, no, and they would have to prove she was had a gun pointed to her head. She did not have a chance to make a phone call. She didn't have a chance to escape. If they were like tied up and she couldn't leave and didn't have access to a phone and she participated, that may be one way she could argue. Uh, but by, by her lawyering up doesn't mean she's come in and said what happened. It's kind of like the Adelsons, you know, when they said they were being blackmailed and all the blackmailers got arrested. They didn't come forward and tell the police, hey, we've been blackmailed. You, you just you lose that credibility. And um, I don't think she's going to have much to say about 
being a victim that would give her full immunity for what she did if they can prove she was present or knew it was happening and didn't report it. Mm. Uh, Patricia Burns here says Tur turning 13 is a milestone age for girls brings about a sense of grown up strength. And I fear Maddie said, stop, or I'm telling. And when he lost it, she turned to mom who did not help her. Uh, Dr. Penicetti, a lot of people do think it was just her 13th birthday. The mom was not present. We don't know why, uh, but people think that this was the trigger, uh, in one way or another, uh, for this homicide. Is this true that at 13, uh, a young girl begins to feel that independence and may have called him out and said, no more, you're not doing this to me anymore? Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, this, 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 I've just heard, I've heard stories and this echoes something that's, I think, really important um, and kind of hits home for me. You know, not only I'm a parent, um, but also uh, I'm Indian and I, you know, just come back from India, actually. And something, ha you know, the obvious happens around 12 and 13. We go through puberty and the body goes through changes. And for a young woman, um, that can have a lot of ramifications that are very confusing. Um, there's figures in your life that you have trusted um, who had loved you and are supposed to care for you. And then this this happens, your body changes and you grow up. And in some cultures, you can even see systemically um, the efforts in place that are, you know, maybe not just, but I think everyone knows this phenomenon that the body changes and specifically for, for young girls, it can be really confusing. And so the trigger, I mean, first of all, that doesn't need to happen for, someone who has got uh, something in the category par paraphilias and pedophilia is within one of that um, subset. It's, it simply means that, you know, what usually leads to uh, sexual gratification um, in the typical population is apparent and um, it is not typical. And that can mean any number of things that are more, you know, benignish, like uh, you know, a, you, you, your imagination can take you there. Um, but then it can be very, very severe, like young kids. And it can be things like power. It can be things like when you mix that with being disenfranchised and then there's vulnerability and then a secret can get out. That is a bad combination. Mm. Um. This uh, to you, uh, Detective Nutting from Elizal Company. Um, this is something that came up in the last show, actually, David. I didn't get a chance to get around to it, but uh, Stefan never had his charges read publicly in a courtroom, and I guess Tim can weigh on this too. Mm -hmm. uh, people claim that they're, you know, protecting him, or that his attorney is protecting him, because we all know, as they call them, chomos uh, in the prison system, uh, they are targets. Uh, what do you make of this, that charges were never formally read inside the courtroom to him, per se? And by uh, the way, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dave, before you answer that, a lot of comments in the chat right now that Jennifer and Stefan Stearns married back in 2015. I've only heard that their boyfriend and girlfriend uh, have not seen any um, confirmation of that, but I'll keep it in mind and I will look for uh, confirmation. But go ahead, David. Sorry about that. Yeah. So uh, as far as I know, he's only had first appearance so he hasn't been arraigned as i think his arraignment scheduled for sometime in april um certainly the victims and i'm sorry the suspects in every criminal case in the united states has a they have a presumption of innocence so there is there is some degree of protections or guidelines that, that all suspects or defendants are presumed innocent until proven guilty so uh I, Tim might be able to speak to this a little bit better on the, what happens exactly at first appearance in terms of if the charges are actually required, but I, I assume it is not if that was something that the attorney specifically asked for, because they do seem rather inflammatory uh, uh, charges. Uh, yeah, Tim Jansen, um, why at his first appearance, charges were apparently not read, at least not read out loud. Is that common? Um, it could be, it depends on if the first appearance was, um, by zoom or within a courtroom full of uh, other, other defendants, 
And if it is a child, um, child porn or, um, you, um, you know, sexual molestation of a child, your lawyer would probably want to waive formal reading and you don't want it to know. You don't want the other inmates to know what your charges are uh, because that, you know, they are, uh, they are in danger in prison and they're, they're inmates in prison who commit other crimes, but the lowest of the low is a child molester. And those are the ones that will be dealt with a lot of times in prison. And so they're protected from other inmates as well as protected from themselves. So because a lot of the inmates have children and they look at that person like he could be doing this to my child. So it's, it's, it's just like when you have a jury selection of a child molestation case. As soon as you read that charge to the jury venari, it changes the whole mood in the courtroom. You try to see how the jurors look. A lot of them put their head down. A lot of them will look at the client. Hell, a lot of them will look at me like I had something to do with it. Um, it it's just it's just terrible. Uh, now, in federal court, when we go to first appearance, you know they they you can waive formal reading because those indictments are pretty lengthy, and the magistrate judge doesn't want to read the whole thing. You don't need to read the whole thing, but I would say it's to protect him from the whole inmates knowing he's a child molester. He wasn't getting bond anyway. Mm. Uh, another question for Dr. P and I have a feeling they're going to keep coming. If you have questions for any of our guests, the detective, the lawyer, we've got the detective, the lawyer, and the psychiatrist, they all walk into a bar and I have no <laughs> idea what happens. Um, Astra coming to us from the UK uh, for Dr. Penicetti. Uh, what would you say to other people in the same situation as Maddie was in? I mean, more importantly, this is a young girl who was, obviously um, on the receiving end of horrific abuse. Uh, no one, it appeared, knew that this was going on. But I guess more from a parental standpoint, um, what kind of conversation do you need to have with your child, um, you know, if, you, if you're the mother specifically, if someone tries to do this at school? Um, I tell my kids, you know, you got to be, you got to communicate. You got to tell me if someone does anything weird. Uh, and I, you know, I probably give really bad advice, but I tell my son, if anyone <laughs> grabs you, you know, kick him in the, you know, where and bite him and scream if we're in, you know, so I, I tell him crazy stuff, but what should you be saying? <laughs> well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even downplay what you're, you're saying there. I think rule number one is your gut. It sounds kind of obvious, but, you know, I think we're all, you know, parents here and stuff at, at, the gut is really important, especially as we know, like our kid is just like a, a piece of us running around in the world. So if your gut is saying something that's important and how to communicate to your kid, you're going to know how to do that um, in a visceral level. But what I can do is, is say two things. One is an overall technique. But secondly, from a parent perspective, like what I have to do after reading the textbook. Right. So number one is. Yes, I can say you always want to have a line of communication with your kid. The reason why that doesn't happen is because of fear, either fear, not just on the kid's part, but the parent's part. All too often, you know, unfortunately, I hear that something had been happening for many years and then you find out about it later. And I have a privilege of hearing all the perspectives often in the family dynamic. Um, sometimes I have an opportunity such as this to talk to experts in law enforcement, et cetera, in the school system, um, community leaders. What I will say from the family dynamic, it is all too often the case that this happens for years. So having a clear line of communication, a safe space. Okay, now how the heck do you do that? How do you actually execute on that? I think that's what you're you're actually hitting on, which is how do we practically do that? What I do, and you got to remember, I'm a psychiatrist, so I got some tricks, and I think to myself, how am I going to navigate this? I have one rule, because you got to remember, people are are sometimes planning these things out for years. So I say, no one, no one is allowed to have a secret with you. No other adult is allowed to have a secret with you. Me and your mother are the only ones, and we can't have secrets with you independently either. 
No one is allowed, no adult is allowed to have a secret with you. No one is allowed to have a secret with you until a certain age, even kids, older kids. But adults, definitely not. Because I'll tell you a real actual situation. You know, when you're traversing it and you're figuring out, hey, who, who can I trust in this village, right? I want to put my kid in sports. I want to put my kid in, you know, go to the school programs. My kid is now outside and doing all these things. And this is so complex. You wonder, how does this happen over and over and over again? And, you know, I'm often talking with the, the, the victim and the perpetrator often in a psychiatric process. So, you know, just kind of putting those two things together allows me to, sometimes it'll be as sophisticated as someone getting an emotional sign off, I call it, from the parent in front of the kid. So think about that, it can, it, not to scare everybody, but just put a, a layer of vigilance that it could be a coach, it could be someone, a teacher. These are the people that we hear about. It can be a, a, a boyfriend, it could be someone, it could be a family member, it could be an uncle, it could be anyone. And so sometimes you get emotional sign off. Now the kid is seeing this their whole life and they're saying, oh, this is someone who's trusted. This is a family friend, this is trusted. In certain cultures, we revere Elders, just like uncle, auntie in our culture. You call every every elder, uncle and auntie. So with my kid, and I suggest this for everyone to try this, like just there's no one who can have a secret. When you put that rule into place, suddenly that guy or that person who is creating that emotional sign off and then creating potentially a very sophisticated plan downstream when the time is right, when all the kids have left baseball practice or when they're driving your, your kid home or when you're, now that is in process. So now your kid knows, hey, daddy said this. And it's not, I think, punching someone or whatever. That's actually too on the nose, if like no pun intended. Mm. I, I want to train my kid to be so sophisticated as to say something like, let me just tell daddy about this. Or like, you know, not on the nose that much, but some sort of inkling that doesn't set off a trigger so that something bad happens. How do you escape that situation so that it doesn't happen? That's how sophisticated we have to get. It's very hard. I can't COE, you better, you better have, that's my wife. You better have that conversation on the way to your little school play today. I like the way you put that. No, no adult can have a secret with you. Uh, COE implement that rule immediately, please. Um, hey, Joel, you, I yes, just want to say in my experience, I've seen a lot of incidents on sleepovers okay mm, when the kid yeah. sleeps over you don't yeah. know who's there they have an older cousin an older brother mm. and you don't know what goes on parents yeah. go to sleep and then you got kids in an, a strange setting they can't run to their mom and dad uh, the other kids are asleep and that's mm. a setting that is really vulnerable to a, a young child especially like their first sleepover that's a great, great point. We just did a story last week. It was a dad. Uh, his daughter had a few girls sleeping over, and he gave them mango smoothies that were drugged. And one of the girls uh, did not have them, and she texted the mother. And horrific story. I presented that one to uh, Phil Waters and Scott Duffy, homicide detective, former FBI agent. So uh, Tim makes a great point. Sleepovers, uh, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable vulnerable point for uh young children coe no more sleepovers <laughs> not till they're 27 years old um to uh detective nutting here from ms ann thorpe um what is your gut tell you? a lot of people who say well you know he doesn't work um we don't know what she does and uh you know they were they were living and uh you know you know sustaining their lifestyle do you think that he was possibly selling this material and you know and it was some sort of bigger conspiracy uh to profit from it uh detective what's your gut tell you yeah i mean certainly there's a whole uh society in the, on the on the dark web or on the internet where where people can exchange these photos and um you know that's you know anonymize their presence online and it, it's certainly a possibility. I, I don't know how much money he possibly could have made to, made to sustain their lifestyle. However, um, you know, I did find it interesting that, you know, he, you know, we talked about how a factory reset his phone, uh, but they were still able to find these images more than likely from the cloud. And I was having a discussion with uh, a reporter down here recently about, 
maybe does you know a lot of people it's not uncommon to have multiple email addresses multiple cloud storage mm. you know he may they may have found one uh email address related and le located some images on there they might have located some of his other email addresses and subpoenaed that um, you know different cloud services to find where he was storing these images online could they have found a small sd card or a thumb drive or some other media storage inside his apartment um, you know, any, any written material that would have led them to additional cloud stored, you know, locations. Uh, I mean, the digital footprint was, is obviously very key in this case. Um, you know, cause once the factory reset the phone, there was nothing there. So, uh, we, we all know how small SD cards are these days. So, you know, it's very interesting how they how they find these I, you know they even train canines these days to go into apartments and find hidden electronic media where people hide them in crevices wow. and it's it's really how did they do that is that off a of scent is that off of uh yeah i'm, I'm not sure how they have these uh <laughs> but they'll find yeah they'll find electronic hidden electronic devices uh wow they must be able to um you know the florida department of law enforcement has a a canine that that tr utilize for um inner cyber search warrants mm. uh by the way i'm i'm working overtime today we're doing another show at seven scott peterson uh went before a judge in northern california today uh, to make a case along with the los angeles innocence project for his innocence and uh, we've got laura ingle who is in the courtroom today and ted rollins from court tv so we'll be doing that at seven o'clock today um by the way back to back to you detective nutting um just real quick th this kept coming up too uh in the tv interviews that we watched with both the boyfriend and jennifer soto they never used maddie's name it was ne it was always a pronoun it was never maddie said you know we we, we miss poor maddie uh what do you make of that uh especially you know as a as a former uh, interviewer slash interrogator well those those interviews were highly problematic for for both of the, uh, especially the defendant and uh, maybe to a lesser degree the mother, but they were extraordinarily odd to say the least. Um, obviously, the defendant uh, in this case, uh, in the sexual, uh, you know, sex crimes case, uh, lied. You know, he. he these, you know, and when somebody lies, it's almost as uh, good as a confession, right? But um, another thing that comes up too, when you know your your defendant or your suspect is not confessing or not communicating with you, it makes the uh, witness interviews all that more important. Uh, a lot of people discount, you know, there's so so much focus on getting a confession, or but but the the witness interviews. Who's in her, uh, her, her in her orbit, either online or in person? Was there outcry witnesses or their neighbors? Were there somebody she was communicating with online? Uh, there's all these these people that they need to interview to find out, and those are going to be hugely important in this case. And her network could be rather uh, extensive, especially when you get into the online environment. Uh, the arraignment for Stefan Starnes, Stearns is uh, set for April 2nd. I'm going to get back to Tim on what to expect from that in a moment. But Andy School, friend of the show in Detroit, uh, this is for the doctor. Some SA survivors stop emotional development at the age when it begins. Um, a son dated girl who avoided eye contact, spoke in short, simple sentences, using a little girl tone at 17. Um, her dad did it to her, I guess, is what she's saying there. But uh, Dr. Penicetti, um, does this happen? Do kids um, sort of have arrested development sometimes at the age that they were um, abused at? Do they, they kind of stop in time in a weird, odd, eerie way? That's, <clears throat> that's a profound question. I'll answer it like this. I'll say, if we think of all of us, if we think of not like adolescence, for example, as a period of time, but an adjective. We think of toddlerhood not as an a, a period of time, but an adjective. We can all be adolescent and we can all be 
toddler ish, you know, we all have attributes. So I'll just say that just to kind of like normalize um, just all of us. That's, I think, what the profound nature of mental health is. It's all on a spectrum, everything. Okay. And yes, there are concrete situations where there's someone's rights being infringed upon. And that's where law enforcement, we lean on to really help us as a society, those checks and balances. But going to being arrested in development, I don't think anyone who goes through a traumatic incident in a point in time ever uh, is not impacted downstream from that. And then being arrested in some of that trauma and some of that memory, absolutely, can you be arrested? I don't want to make it magical, though, by saying, you know, this person, um, th that there's any one truth for any one person, and that they're going to be stuck at the time, at the age where that happened. They're going to speak in that tone of voice. Now, is that is that possible? Can someone get, um, can it affect their sexual development? Can it affect their trust, you know, their relationships? Um, just with, you know, the you know, as they age and like when they are trying to find a primary partner or get married or what have you, can it affect their relationships with their their mother? Can it affect their relationship with them when they become a mother? Um, yes, to all of that. And so that part of you, I would, we always say in mental health, you don't solve things. Um, we manage them. That's unfortunately, unfortunately what we have to do in all of health care. We have to manage diabetes. We have to manage trauma. We have to manage sexual assault, unfortunately. And it's, it's, um, and it's devastating, you know, um, but we also have to prevent it. That's the glimmer of hope. That's the reason why I, I think we're having this conversation is to bring light to these conversations that are often buried. So I want to also say, say um, that yeah, and I uh, appreciate that, and I think you're right. We're trying to bring light to the situation, both from a psychiatric point of view, that's why we've got the doctor on, a legal point of view, and also an investigative point of view. Uh, this is obviously uh, the victim here, um, remembering Madeline Soto. By the way, COE last night was working so hard, I come out, it's like 4 in the morning, she's sleeping with her head on the... She can sleep anywhere. She was literally sleeping with her head on the kitchen counter because she was working on these new graphics. So uh, kudos to the COE. She's a wild one. Now. I've got to watch her uh, asleep on the kitchen counter. Uh, she was determined to get some new graphics and we're working on a, a new show open as well. I want to get into this timeline. Um, that is obviously Maddie. This is our focus today. Uh, you know, it's tough to look at this set of photos here, but we have to, um, uh, to remember her, but man, uh, that is a life cut way too short in a absolutely horrific way. And, uh, she did nothing, uh, to deserve it. No one does, but this, uh, she's particularly vulnerable and, uh, and young. I'm going to remove her just so we can get the full panel up here now, but a uh, question for, um, David Nutting, the detective, um, what is the sequence of the investigative events that happened now? I'm just going to go before you answer that, David. I always do this to you for some reason. I ask you a question and I tell you to hold on, but this is the day she disappeared. So Stefan Stearns claims he drops Madeline off near Hunter's Creek middle school and she walks to school. They looked at video. The, the mother said it was near a church. They never saw anything at seven 35 AM. That same morning, uh, Stefan Stearns throws items into a dumpster at the family's Kissimmee apartment complex Madeline's backpack and laptop are later found inside. 821, you see Stefan Stearns returning to his apartment with Madeline in the car. Police believe she was dead then, which is absolutely sick. 4.30 p.m., uh, this is the issue that was raised about the school system because she didn't. the school did not notify the mother until 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon that she wasn't there for, uh, you know, for pickup. And at 8 o'clock uh, that evening, Jennifer Soto reports Madeline missing. Uh, Madeline's phone was uh, left at home. So um, Detective Nutting, looking at this timeline from day one, a uh, ton of time, the whole day till 8 o'clock basically passes. 
uh, 8 p.m. East, you know, Eastern time till something happens with the mom. Um, what do you make of that? And what are investigators, two-part question, what are they doing right now, do you think? Well, you know, you have, you have three timelines of significance. You have uh, Madeline's timeline. Uh, when she, when are the detectives able to say with, with some degree of certainty that Madeline was last known to be alive? That's going to be uh, presumably through any witness interviews, neighbors, uh, anybody she may have called, texted, anybody uh, she may have been online with. That's going to be very important to know when she was last alive. That, so that so you're looking at Madeline's timeline, and then you're looking at the the boyfriend's timeline, and and it seems like they have some pretty significant uh, details in terms of what he says, and then what they can what they where they know he was, um, and then uh, of course the the mother's timeline uh, if. Madeline was known last time to be alive, say, just put the number out there, for example, at, at, at 10 p.m. And she was, that was the last time we can say definitively that she was on the phone, she was texting, she was online, whatever. So somebody can actually say that she was still alive. And then, but the, the mother and the boyfriend are still inside the house. Then the question becomes, uh, once the cause and the manner of death is released, you know, which one of those perpetrators or, or maybe that's not the right choice of word, but which one of those two individuals was responsible for Maddie's death? Um, I had a particular case in Orange County where uh, to this day remains unsolved, where the, the mother left for work. They were in a hotel and we knew the child was alive. We had him on video looking out of a of the hotel room door uh there's a camera right above the the hotel room and that was the last image of him being alive the mother leaves for work the next morning and the boyfriend calls the calls 911 once the child is unresponsive so we know that one of those two people uh murdered the child beat the child to death but we can't we can't say which one so the, to this day, this case remains unsolved almost a decade later. That's one that, that really sticks with me because I was well, the one who analyzed the video and looked at the kid, you know, Bubby. That's what it looked at Bubby looking out the door at, at the camera, you know. And then after that, it was he was he was killed sometime after that. So wow. So um, you just never, you know, you know, I mean, it's a it's it's very I think we discussed this last time I was on. So, you know, say for example the what what the state has to prove, what the police have to prove is who uh, murdered Maddie, you know, because if, if, um, and they have to be prepared to defend that in court when, um, uh, you know, the, the defendant says, Hey, you know what? I, all I, she was, I don't know what happened to her. She was, she was dead and I panicked and I, I got rid of the body and I made up this cockamamie story, but I don't know how she died. You know, yeah, I might be a child molester, but I'm not a murderer. And I just panicked. I knew when, when this happened that I was going to be in a lot of trouble. So now the state has to to prove who who killed Maddie. And easier said than done. I think we, we it's like we said before. He's already been convicted in the in the, the court of public opinion. But that is extremely different than the court of law. Uh, Tim Jansen, I completely forgot to come back to you. So the arraignment for <laughs> Stefan uh, Stearns is April second. Mm -hmm. um, People were asking, uh, will he have to be present for that arraignment? Walk us through uh, what will happen on that day, uh, keeping in mind that 60 additional charges were levied against him today. Well, at arraignment, they'll they'll bring him forward to make sure they'll read the charges to him, make sure he's got a, a lawyer, if he's going to hire a lawyer. Um, he doesn't have to be there for arraignment because he can act up. And if he acts up so much, the court will just remove him or he can say, I'm not coming. And they can't physically force him to come to an arraignment. On that timeline that you just showed up there, number two is the evidence, right? Number two is the whole case. He's throwing away the dumpster. He's throwing away the backpack that was later found in the dumpster at 735. Okay? He's throwing it away because he's already killed her. So how's he going to explain throwing away her, her backpack in the dumpster at 735 
and then claiming at 4.30 we didn't know where she was. You can't, there's no answer for that. Yeah. I Tim, mean, how big a problem is it? You see number four, yeah. uh, Jennifer Soto emails Madeline's teacher in the afternoon when she wasn't there for pickup, but then she doesn't call for those three and a half hours. Um, what does that tell you? Well, one, I'd want to know what time school gets out. Unless she stays till 4.30, that seems awful late when you're being dropped off at 7.30. Mm. Usually I would think they get out like 2 or 2.30 or so. Um, but yeah, you got three and a half hours. If that was your child missing, my gosh, you'd be calling the police immediately at 4.35. Um, you'd be up at the school. You wouldn't be sending emails, right? You'd be going up there looking for your child. So it, it looks like before 7.30, the child was killed. Um, yeah, and she was on her way at 7 a.m. So 30 minutes after she was on her way to school, he's dumping her her computer into into a dumpster. Uh, just just horrific. Uh, and we're all we're all parents here. Uh, Dave, do you have kids? I never asked you. Yeah, I do. They're they're uh yeah they're 27 and well, 29. So they're older. Um, they're, yeah. they're, they're still not allowed to have secrets. So <laughs> make, right. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> never it never ends um doesn't, doesn't. dr penicetti so um what we're learning uh part of what we're learning is that this guy stefan stearns was in maddie soto's life for about seven years before uh this murder happened so since she was i guess six years old uh they say the abuse started at 11 um do you think that it could have started even earlier? Maybe they just haven't found the evidence. I mean, what what is the psychology behind these uh, abusers? You know, why why would he suddenly start at eleven and let's say not start at nine or eight or seven? Well, I'll leave the detective work and the legal <laughs> work to the experts. I I guess for me it doesn't. I I won't. I often don't know most of the parts of the story. Um, and to me, we don't know, like it could have, it could have very well could have, I don't know about this case. I don't know about these people. I can't comment on it's just that. more broadly though, about like broadly. kind of the psychopathy, the psychology behind these people that commit this abuse. Yeah. So I think it definitely often starts way before then <laughs> we suspect that's, that's, that's number one. Number two, we're often, seeing the result of something um, tragic, um, whether it's a violent crime or whether it's someone taking their life. Um, you know, again, it's, it's after, unfortunately, a long period of time. And the psychopathology, if you're asking about paraphilias and specifically pedophilia, it often is a long course, unfortunately. Um, and it often is, as as you all know on this panel, like repet repetition. It's it's happening more than once, and so um, unfortunately, what that means is that you know it's happening without you know. There's a secret to your point you're alluding to, and that's why it's important. You know, when we get past a certain age of vulnerability. First of all, if I can get to 28, 29 with my kids, I want to, I want an, uh, an award or a trophy or a plaque or something. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, I think it's really hard work and, you know, I, I got two young ones, but like, it, it's really tough to just be vigilant of all these things and try to put in place. The, the reality is that, you know, our kids are going to be out there running around and we, let's, let's also have glimmers here, which are life is beautiful. And, you know, there is, all these things that I want my kids to be doing out in the world, sports and, you know, after school activities, school and be trusting and be loving with amazing family members and, and not lose that hope in kind of society and love and in general, but just be conscious of how to put those guardrails in place. Um, but it does happen repeatedly. So that's why having that safe space, which is easier said than done, but just always, you know, having your kid, understand that you're nothing's going to change you're going to love them no matter what no matter what's going on and that you're on their side over you know anyone else's if we're doing this like a courtroom because you know they're your kid and that you're going to believe them um just saying hey you know i love these two phrases like you know i believe it tell me more 
I think what I do, you know, as a child psychiatrist, I would say play therapy is a very, very important modality, but you don't, you know, you don't need to be a psychiatrist to do that, right? You just play, hang out with your kids and they tell you the stories. They tell you it not on the nose though. They play with the cars. My son was playing with some cars the other day. I just asked him some questions about the cars. They'll tell you stories. If you listen, everyone will tell you everything. I, I love that line before, which is a lie is, this is, is just as good as a confession in a sense, right? So if we're listening, we can kind of get an understanding of when something is off. I'll tell you, I was a pediatrician, um, pediatrics resident for five years before all the child and adolescent psychiatry. And, you know, you listen to heartbeats and they say that most people with the stethoscope, they actually don't really know lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. And you're like, oh my God, how am I going to catch a murmur? How am I going to catch a murmur? How am I going to catch a murmur? It's like lub, lub, it's so subtle. And it turns out that like most people have a lot of difficulty with this. But if you hear enough lub dubs, one day you're just like, Lub dub, lub dub, lub. And you're like, I don't know what I heard, but it's it's off. The rhythm is off. And that's where we kind of have to get to with our kids. That's why the safe space is there. But they're telling us everything if we're just listening, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, and they do like to talk. And sometimes they don't like to stop talking. Yes. It could, could be a problem on uh, Saturday mornings. But a little bit here with the uh, super chat. Uh, I thought mom called it four thirty <laughs> and smart and put yeah. those together. It's, like, yeah, um, it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, I thought mom called at four thirty, but cops didn't come until eight. Any thoughts? Um, it looks like I'll have to double check that. Um, but I don't think she called. Um, I think she got contacted by the school at at, at four thirty, but didn't actually call uh, police until then. Um, Tim Jansen, you've got a difficult job because you're a criminal defense attorney. We, we're hearing that the mother is now lawyered up. Hypothetically, she calls the offices of Jansen and Davis. She calls the best criminal defense attorney in Florida. Um, what would you do? What are your first steps in uh, defending this woman besides telling her not to talk? What, what else do you do? Well, obviously, you're not going to let her talk. Hmm. Um, I just said, besides talking, Tim Jansen, I'm going to <laughs> backtrack her whereabouts that day. I'm going to ask her about the schedule of the child. Was it normal for the father to take the child to school? Did he normally take the child? Did the child have a phone? Did you see the child before? I want to know some things, but then I don't want to ask her everything because you never know what the defense is going to be. Um, and if she has something that she can give, maybe negotiate to save her from a life sentence um, because that's what it looks like. It looks like she's got some involvement. She either put her head in the sand and allowed it to happen. And she's going to be charged ultimately because they will charge her. If they get enough, they're going to charge her. Even if it's just child abuse, failure to report or possibly conspiracy to first degree murder as a principal. So she better be telling her lawyer everything. So her lawyer can, try to work something before the state gets everything they've got, then they don't need to negotiate with her. They're just going to charge her. But if she can help the investigation get to the murder, then she might have something. But uh, I just, I didn't have a good feeling about her interview. I didn't have a good feeling about his interview. And uh, so it's, it doesn't, it's not just a confession that the police want. When they interview a person, they want to lock him into a story. Right. They, they, if they get the confession, that's a that's a home run. But if they can lock him into the story, now they're investigating to show that story's a lie. And once they can show that story's a lie, now they know they're getting close. Right. Now they know they're pinpointing on who's involved. And then they want to know why'd you lie? Then they'll bring her in. Why'd you lie? Right. And how it goes, Dave. Yeah. I mean, you look at, uh, you know, as, as we're sitting here talking, I'm thinking about different reasons and we we don't know the cause and manner of death yet i mean it's, it's mm -hmm. you know we're assuming it's going to be homicide but there are there's five manners of death there's homicide suicide natural accidental mm -hmm. and of course undetermined um, dave let me let me jump in there real quick because there's been a lot of people in the chat uh and i just want to have you clear this up who said what if she unalived herself in the woods but i thought the police and correct me if i'm wrong I thought the police came out and said that she was in fact murdered. No, 
Yeah, I, I, it's gonna it's gonna have to come down to the medical examiner's uh, determination of the manner of death. So, uh, I mean, let's just be quite frank here. In, in my experience, I mean, I, I unfortunately have seen children of young ages commit suicide, mm -hmm. and this is, uh, and even in some cases, they'll leave notes behind de detailing uh, abuse. So. Could that have been a possibility? Uh, you know, I don't know. Do, do sometimes suicide, does trauma of suicide mirror homicide or vice versa? Yes, uh, that could be a possibility. So there's a lot of things that we just don't know. I mean, even even more out there is is it could she have had a natural condition that that led to her led to her passing away? And then what you know that's that's the kind of things that are people really need to kind of pump the brakes on a little bit and then just wait until all the the factors come out you know that that's what the toxicology and i'm not saying any of that happened but you know yeah. we don't we don't know what we don't know right and, yeah and Dave, that's a great point but also um i think in the state of florida the very strict rules about releasing information about kids right. under the age of 13 or 13 and younger but david do you think that i mean the media usually does a pretty good job we'll, we'll probably find out one way or another what do you think david but hey, Dave, yeah. the body was found twenty to thirty minutes away from where she was last seen. I take right. it that she probably didn't commit suicide twenty to thirty minutes, you know, from where she was last seen. Right, so just because I, you don't, and because she couldn't get there is what you're saying. Well, that, and if she's going to do it, she's probably going to do it in a familiar place, her happy place, and unless yeah. that place is a place she's been before where she wants to go under an oak tree or something, I, I find that hard to believe. Well, and then there's her. also obviously the witnesses uh, who saw uh, Stefan Stearns with what they believe to be was the body, but go ahead, David. So uh, for example, we had a, we had a case of a teenager who committed suicide and left and, and she did it in her bedroom, you know? Okay. And then, I, I mean, you know, it's just the spitball and, you know, possibilities here. I have no inside knowledge whatsoever, but say, you know, she left a note detailing the abuse and he was, and he freaked out. Like, what, what, what do I do? You know? And I, I, we talked about this before. It's very disorganized the way this whole morning went. Um, you know, it, I'm not saying that happened by any means, but I'm saying it's a possibility given what we, what we know. So that's, but back to the point of that's what, the prosecutors and the detectives have to make sure that did not happen before they can charge a crime. Sure. So, hmm. I mean, could it, could um, she have passed away in the apartment and then been, um, you know, disposed of with this cockamamie story and, and, uh, you know, they, they, they have to be ready for that, um, hmm. revelation. Yeah, it could go a million different ways. Uh, sure. Renee Voice Brand here for Tim. Uh, if and when investigators find definitive proof that Stearns is responsible for her murder, if they do, uh, Tim, will he cop a plea and plead guilty to avoid the death penalty? And you told us capital sexual battery, which is abuse against child, uh, I think, under the age of 13, so 12 and under, um, carries under the 12. death penalty. Under, under 12. 12. Under carries, 12. Okay, so it carries the death penalty. Right. Um, they, depending on the evidence, who his lawyer is, you would think he will try to cop a plea not to get the death penalty. Maybe he cuts a deal and, 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 and gets the wife involved, right? Maybe he cuts a deal and gives evidence that the wife knew what was going on, participated. State might cut that deal. If they're going to give him life in prison for the rest of his life and have the wife also be charged, depending on the evidence, I think the state probably would cut a deal like that. Save the family from the grief, the photos, a trial, and get two people responsible. I don't know the prosecutor down there, but, you know, they always want to get the person responsible. And they're going to, if the wife knew and the mother, the mother knew, then, you know, she's the one that had the most responsibility. It's his, her child, right? And she's bringing this outsider, stepfather, and she's supposed to protect that child. No matter how much she loves that guy, no matter how much she depends on his money, she is responsible for that child. So, could could she be charged? Uh, this is a question from Lindsay Shea. Uh, could she be charged if she didn't know? Because you just said the mother is responsible for the child. Uh, could she be hit with some sort of neglect charge potentially? It, it, it yeah. Well, the problem is now is that the child is dead. 
Yeah. Right. And so who's going to be the witness? The only way the, the, if the child could say mama knew or I told my mom or if there's text messages to the mom or emails to the mom or somehow a friend comes forward and says she told her mother, but mother didn't want to believe her. Then you have then you have something but it's going to be hard to prove. I don't know how the mom's going to say she didn't know, especially when a child was being molested, at least back in, when she was 11, at least two to three years. Right. Isn't that what they think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, more yeah. than two years back, they think. Um, I'm going to get back to the doctor in a minute, but La Mesa here uh, for the detective. Uh, David, could it be beneficial if they just talk to the mom about the nature and length of the relationship between her and Stefan Stearns? I feel like letting her talk at length about Stefan Stearns when he entered her life, etc. cetera. Um, I would imagine, I mean, she's lawyered up now, but I imagine they've had a bunch of days. Um, what do you think happened between investigators and the mother up to the point that she lawyered up? I assume they had very lengthy uh, interviews with her. Sure. Now that you're exactly right, I'm sure she gave some type of statement about the relationship. They probably had extensive conversations with her. But now if she's not talking, those conversations are going to pivot to uh, her friend's family, co-workers who may be able to shed some light on the neighbors even that could shed some light on the nature of the relationship, the length of the relationship, what, um, you know, the relationship was like. So, you know, like we had discussed before that now that neither of them are, are talking and well, the suspect hasn't been talking for a while, that's where these other interviews become so important with uh, the witnesses and, and, uh, you know, people that are uh, associates of everybody involved. Yeah, and, and David, a follow-up question from Sherry Wilson. Why no charges for disposing of her body already? Is that because of what we just talked about, that there is a small chance that uh, she was not disposed there, that maybe she got there somehow? Yeah, well, this, that's, a, that's a misdemeanor in the state of Florida, believe it or not. There is some mm -hmm. legislation pending to make it a felony, but it would only make it a third-degree felony. And quite honestly, that's... The, the least of his concerns at this point. Yeah. Right. Even, um, even the tampering with evidence, you know, clearly they have him throwing her backpack away. That that's, that's a very minor charge compared to what he's facing. Yeah. I always get nervous with a new guest, Dr. P. So we're going to go probably another 15, 20 minutes. So obviously we want you here, Dr. P, but I know you're a busy doctor. So if you have to jump, I don't know if Steve Cohen told you that. So, uh, the, the, the world is your oyster, but we want you here. Kathy Barella here says, uh, doctor, is it harder for boys or young men? This is a good question to come forward. If they have experienced this. I think by the nature, yes. Cause there's more stigma. Yeah. And, and, and the, the mother, I don't have the interviews today. I wish I did. Um, but in her interviews, the mother, Jennifer Soto, seemed very disconnected. Um, you know, she, she we had a behavioral panel on of experts who study beha uh, human behavior last night. Um, some have said, you know, maybe she's medicated. Others have said maybe she's on the autism spectrum. But just speak to the way that different people react to trauma, because she seemed um I don't want to say calm, but she just, her affect was very like, like if it was me, I'd be angry. I'd be fired up. I'd be whatever. But her affect was very sort of one dimensional. Um, how do people react differently to trauma? I think everybody acts differently to trauma. So it's yeah. hard to kind of, you know, make deductions. I, I would, I would caution to make, too many deductions and then um, go upstream based on someone's affect. Um, there is, you know, when we do a mental status exam, there are, there are parts of that that include us looking at affect, whether it's mm -hmm. full range, whether someone has the ability to, you know, smile and, and so forth. But to make upstream conclusions or downstream conclusions from that, because everybody responds to trauma differently. And quite frankly, I mean, again, I defer to the, the experts who have, you know, so much experience on the law and legal part of this. But people have good poker face 
I mean, what can you make of what um, it becomes? Uh, it can become a little bit of a circus, I think, a clinical circus, in my opinion. So I think everyone responds, you know, just to land the plane there, Joel. And I've been on this on your show before. So like, I want to be uh, respectful of uh, your, your process here. Yeah. Um, different people respond differently. But I'm really hoping that in the purpose of this and, and I, what I what I find really compelling about speaking with some professionals on the legal side, especially especially in bringing this to light is again, it's about prevention and like maybe arming folks, to, you know, to use some, I don't know, I'm just shooting at the hip here with metaphors. Yeah. So, um, but arming people with some mental health literacy, like yeah. how do we, how do we handle all this stuff? What do we do with all this now? And systems, checks and balances you're from media you know i mean mm -hmm. there is uh we're we all need to improve actually yeah. on how the depiction of uh violence and suicide uh you know there's guidelines that are emerging this is why these dialogues are important too because i think when it, we come together we can figure those things out better and like i said how we can help kids families prevent this but then also deal with it it's a complex one, you know, without romanticizing something unintentionally, et cetera. Yeah, I agree. Life is very complicated. I'll tell you what, though, you already helped me just with that um, secret comment. That's a, a very tangible. I'm a very like tactile, tangible guy. Uh, my advice to my son about kicking the guy in the groin, probably not the best advice, but I will talk to them about uh, keeping secrets uh, and not not keeping secrets, um, more importantly. So uh, this is. Um, by the way, shout out to True Lifestyles, who's in the chat. Um, she did a show with the COE earlier today about uh, the Charlie Adelson call log, another story that we've been following. If you missed that, check it out. Uh, this is the next day, uh, Madeline Soto. So this is the day after um, you know, she goes missing. Madeline Soto's mom, Jennifer, agrees to do TV interviews and asks the public for help. Stefan Stearns is with Jennifer as she is interviewed. He also answers questions about Madeline Soto dropping her off and how he feels about her disappearance. Police re release a public alert about missing 13 year old Madeline Soto. Uh, David Nutting, uh, what on this part of the timeline uh, jumps out at you, if anything <laughs> at all? Yeah, I mean, clearly, uh, the Stefan knew that he was going to be implicated. Uh, he had to have known. Uh, it just boggles my mind that he would have agreed to do an interview. Uh, clearly, he thought he was going to be able to convince everybody and was hoping that her, her body would not be found, that the there would be no digital, there'd be no physical evidence. It's just, just amazing that he – but thank goodness he did provide a statement because he didn't really talk to the to law enforcement and provide them with a, with a confession. So – uh, this is really all we have uh, for both of them. So, uh, yeah, it's just really, really odd. Um, yeah, we're whole... also, I think we're like, you know, we're also at the very early stages, obviously, of this investigation. Police have a ton of work. Tim, anything on this part of the timeline that jumps out at you uh, for one reason or another? The, the odd thing to me, by the way, Tim, before you answer, is mm. uh, we do have video of, uh, not right now. I had it yesterday. Stefan Stearns, Tim Jansen, is literally pacing back and forth in the background while the mother is giving an interview on TV. Um, really, really weird behavior, um, you know, kind of a controlling type behavior. But uh, Tim Jansen, with your legal mind, any of this uh, stand out to you for one reason or another? Well, I go back to the, the timeline where he's seen throwing the computer in the dumpster. Mm, if he if he did throw that computer in the dumpster, why the next day is he doing a a press release or being interviewed and didn't mention it? Why mm. didn't he say I found I found this computer, I threw it away? No. Sounds like it was rare for her to not have her phone. What happens with the phone and a the computer? They can be tracked. So he got rid of both. He he maybe he left the phone and maybe he dumped dumped the uh, computer so it couldn't be track tracking where her whereabouts. Mm. Um I, I, I've seen people, we've all seen people get up there and cry. Their missing wife is crying and crying. And next thing you know, a week later, they're arrested for the murder of their spouse. So 
you can't say someone is innocent because they cried. You can't say someone's guilty because they didn't. Um, but some people are pathological liars. Mm -hmm. I take it the guy was pacing because I think what he was doing was trying to think in his mind what he was going to say and listening to what she's saying in the questions so he could be ready to come up with some story. That's what I think he was doing. But that's just a guess. You know? No, you're probably right. He had, a, he had a vape pen. He was nervous. He's cracking his yeah. knuckles. It was, a, it was a really weird thing. So this is, if I'm doing the math right, about four days later, two days after the last one we just looked at, over 100 deputies, detectives, intelligence analysts, and specialized personnel joined the investigation and in searched for Maddie Soto. Uh, Madeline's school principal sends a mass email alerting families of what's happened and to send any info or tips to police. Police access Madeline's phone. They find information that indicated she wanted to live in the woods when she turned 13 years old on February 22nd. That is heartbreaking. Um, but David, uh, this is sort of pertinent uh, just when you realize where she was found. Um, this goes to the point that some people are raising maybe that she is there the possibility that she unalived herself because she mm -hmm. wanted to be in the woods and that's where she went. Seems far fetched to me, but, uh, David, what stands out here to you? Yeah, the, the, what's, what's interesting is that, you know, the school where she went to was in a different County than where she lived, which is kind of out of the ordinary. My, my, Assumption is she was using somebody else's address to attend a, a different school. Um, and that may have had some implications on the notification to the mother. Uh, just if, if she was, if, if that was the case, uh, you know, the, the, the search that ultimately led to her location, I believe came from um, somebody who had a camera that saw him or was changing a tire somewhere in the area, had him on, on camera. So uh, there was some questions on why that, why they suddenly, why there was a lull in the day after she was reported missing in the search for her, her body. So, or the search for her, they didn't know she was deceased at the point, but the search around and then around the school where, where Soto um, or Maddie was, reported by the boyfriend to have last been seen was not being searched anymore. So that tells me that they probably had a pretty good idea pretty quickly that, uh, were, that she was not there. And, mm -hmm. and of course they found the body a few days later. So yeah. and there was no, no real massive searches, uh, other than that immediately that day after and then around the school, which now we know she was never there in the first place. Hey Joel, number the number three, where she said she wants to live in the in the woods. Yeah, tells me that she was so physically being assaulted mm. that she would rather live in the woods with animals and be in the house and be a victim again. That's what I look at it. She was safe. She felt safer in the woods at thirteen than she did in a home with her own mother. As a perfect sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. Jump in, Doc. That's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. We're listening. We create the safe space, and this is kind of like you know, I, I I will hop after this just because of a case, um, yeah. clinical case um, I have to attend to, but that's a perfect example of well, we don't know exactly what's upstream, but it's a sign that hey something could be off, uh -huh. and just creating that safe space, having the line of communication saying hey we can talk about anything. And uh, you're always going to be loved and all that type of thing. That's very important. But having a tactile, as you said, Joel, um, thing, no no secrets, not even with me. No adult should ever ask you to keep a secret. And if they do, let me know about it. We'll talk about it. There's nothing we can't talk about. So, Dr. Pettis, uh, uh, th th thank you so much for your time. Uh, a lot of great insight. We'll have you back on soon. Appreciate it. Thanks thank for you. having me. Okay. Um, yeah, the secret, the secret, and I don't mean the book that Oprah endorsed, not that <laughs> secret, this secret, um, Rachel That's Rose, um, Madeline may have had a journal. It's a great point. Um, right. 13 year olds, a lot of times, uh, David, I, I don't know if it's been publicly, publicly, you know, out there. I assume that by now the police would have executed some sort of search warrant, uh, been back to the home in, in Kissimmee, 
Um, is that uh, correct, do you think? Do you think they have collected evidence from the home? Yeah, and I, I alluded to another case that I worked as a, as a detective. My, my team went out on a, unfortunately, a female juvenile teenage girl uh, committed suicide and did, in fact, keep a journal that detailed, well, that wasn't detailed, that alluded to the fact that she had been um, the victim of sexual assault uh, by a family member, you know, and like Tim had pointed out before, there was there's no witness, there's no there's no physical evidence, and your victim uh, is passed away, then there's no the case becomes virtually unprosecutable unless the person confesses, and that was what happened in this case. So, but yes, I would not be surprised if there was a journal, and if there was, if it was found, if there was. Uh, some type of notes being kept in by Maddie that that those were um, likely destroyed if if um, the suspect was able to get his or her hands on it. Mm. Hey, hey Tim, you know uh, for um, David Nutting as a detective, these are the toughest cases. Are they the mm -hmm. hardest ones for you as a criminal defense attorney too? When you're dealing with young children who are victims, absolutely horrible. The worst cases you can get. It's just, it's just, it's just terrible. And a lot of times you don't know what you're getting into because they're not all, always charged with capital sexual battery, right? Mm -hmm. You get, and you're representing someone and all, and all of a sudden they find something on the phone and they amend the charges. And now you, you're representing someone that you really didn't even know you're, you're on. And you got these really bad charges. They're, they're bad charges. Mm -hmm. um, but you, and I, I hate to say it, it's always stepkids. And the one time it was the actual physical daughter, it it, it was, it was. Uh, I mean, it's depressing to tell you the truth. After he was convicted, the daughter asked the judge if she could hug her father and forgive him mm -hmm. in the courtroom. That's heavy. And he he was wearing a cross, a wooden cross. And then when she left, he gave. She was wearing it. I, the whole, the judge, the prosecutor, we didn't know what to do after what we had just seen. It That's, was, um, it yeah. was awful. You know, we have Collier Landry on his own father killed his own mother, biological all the way around. And uh, he says, I still love my father. He's, he's even visited him in prison. He's set to get out by the way, but um, it's tough to break that bond. Even if the worst things happen between uh, mm -hmm. biological parents and their, and their children um just a shout out to wesley john holmes and aussie living in uh tokyo uh let's look at uh um the last two uh on this timeline that the coe put together uh this is later in the day a few days later uh the arrest detectives discovered disturbing images that were quote unquote criminal and sexual in nature on stefan stern's phone Phone data shows someone tried to delete images with a factory reset. He said that he accidentally did that, which we know is next to impossible, if not actually impossible. Then he is arrested, faces charges of sexual battery, and possession of child sex abuse materials, no bond. Stearns refuses to answer. He's doing TV a few days before, now refuses to answer any questions and requests mm -hmm. an attorney. Um, this part of the timeline, uh, David Nutting, what stands out to you and just more forward looking, like what, what would they use here to move the investigation forward from where they're at right now? Well, soon we'll be able to see what, uh, you know, as, as more affidavits and uh, arrest reports come out and discovery is made, um, you know, we're, we're, I think it's going to be really, we've covered a lot of ground the, the two times I've been on, covered a lot of theories. And uh, at the end of the day, when all, when this all becomes public, I think we're going to be really uh, impressed by the quality of the work that the detectives have done. But in terms of this um, a timeline, of course, number two, when he's arrested, I mean, you have his, his pre-arrest conduct and then his his post-arrest conduct uh, like you say is completely different he's pre-arrest he's on the on the media he's you know given interviews uh as soon as he's arrested he's you know he just 
withdraws. Uh, he doesn't come come to his court appearances. He's looks very sullen and uh, on his perp walk, and that's really the last public appearance we've seen of him. In uh, his, uh, I don't know, what would you call it? what kind of suit did you call that? That's a Tyvek suit, but what did you call that that he was wearing? The paper mache, maybe. <laughs> yeah, paper mache. It was just like, yeah. So he can't so, unalive himself. Yeah. Right, can't unalive himself. Yeah. So that, you know, obviously they, they took all of his clothes. Uh, he was probably subjected to some pretty, um, I don't know if you'd call it humiliating, but some pretty invasive, uh, exams before he did his perp, perp walk with the extraction of his DNA underneath his fingernails, I'm sure was a search for biological material, scrapes, hairs plucked, all pursuant to a, a court order, which I'm sure was granted in short order uh, to the detectives at the time. So um, yeah, his after that number two right there jumps out as his, his life drastically changed at that moment. Yeah, and, and David, I assume he's being kept in some sort of solitary protective custody just for because oh, of the high profile that. nature yeah okay yeah. um tim jansen from uh kess in south carolina uh is it true a defendant is not required to tell their side of the story to their attorney if you have a client does he have to tell you anything at all and in fact most times the lawyers don't want to know mm. it presents go. an ethical dilemma if the client tells you what they really did Mm -hmm. um, usually you find out in, in, in not murder sex cases, in most cases, what the police says in the report and what your client tells you, what really happened is somewhere in between. Okay. That's how it usually falls. It's usually not as bad as the police report and not as good as your client says. That's, that's the average, but there's times you don't want to know. I'd rather look at a report and see what he's charged, what the allegations are than ask my client. There'll be time to find out later their side, but not at the beginning of representation. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, with, with homicide cases, you know, you have no surviving victim. You know, that's the only type of case where you have somebody who can't uh, tell what happened. And that, that makes it extraordinarily difficult because uh, prosecutors are asking jurors to, to connect the dots sometimes, uh, you know, based on circumstantial evidence or uh, other factors. And it, it's, it is the most difficult cases to prosecute successfully. So, Dave, I had a case where shot the guys like seven times. Cops pull up. Who shot you? And names the client three times. And then he dies. Dying declaration. Who sure. shot you? Billy shot me. Who? Billy. Billy so-and-so. That's that's where you have a, a a dead and but the defendant or the victim is testifying because that's an admissible in court. All right, All right. It's tough. It's tough to get over that. Tim, yeah. this is an interesting question here, Tim. Um, because they say they dropped her at a church, and Renee wants to know if Maddie spoke with her pastor or priest about Stearns. Does the pastor or priest have a legal obligation to speak with? Invest. Let's say it was during. I don't know. I'm Jewish. Forgive me. I don't know what age you go to confession. If you probably yeah. don't go that young, but if she did oh, speak do. to a priest, you yeah. You if do. you did speak to a priest, um, is he is he, uh, you know, does does he need is he compelled to 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 spill the beans? Now, if Madeline or did if Stefan? Spoke, no, 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 no. If uh, Madeline, if Maddie said something, I, I think the privilege would go to Madeline, not to the priest, right? So mm -hmm. he could discuss it once I get, I think once Madeline is deceased. Now, if Stefan admitted that he molested the child, the priest probably would not uh, disclose it. Um, really? Yeah. yeah. That, that's interesting. It's a whole different uh, show, I think, but that's interesting. Right. You uh, mentioned David, you uh, to... yeah, somebody that they may have been married, but that hasn't been, and that you had the husband so, wife privilege too, if that, if that's a, that comes yeah, there, there's some there's some reports within the chat that they were married in 2015. I have not gotten confirmation of that. So uh, um, and I think that there is. Uh, here we go. No, a Catholic priest is bound by his vow. I think he is never allowed to repeat what someone tells him in confession. That's interesting. I did not know that. Well, um, that tells you how long I've been to confession. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Better be careful there, Tim Jansen. Exactly. Um, so this is the final uh, piece of the timeline here. 
March 1st, 2024, sheriff deputies find the body of Maddie Soto. Orange County deputies say they discover her in a wooded area off Hickory Tree Road in Osceola County. That night, the community gathers to hold a vigil and honor the short life and the memory of 13-year-old uh, Maddie. Not much to uh, to talk about here, David, other than the fact that, um, you know, it is, it's, it's a, now that I'm thinking about it, it's eerie that she said she wanted to go live in the, in the woods, but, um, Man, uh, where David, where do you think we stand today? Like, what are investigators, your old co-workers, what, what are people mm -hmm. in the Kissimmee PD? Uh, I know you didn't work there, but what are people doing today, the homicide detectives or the detectives, I should say, that are working this case right now? Well, part of it's a, a bit of a waiting game on uh, on lab results, um, toxicology, uh, DNA. Uh, did she have, you know, uh, perpetrator's DNA in areas where it wasn't supposed to be? You know, how obviously they lived together. So you would expect there would should be some exchange of, uh, you know, hair and fibers to some degree. I mean, you can't, uh, you know, she rode that car every day. But if her biological material was in the car, I'm sure that was subject to search. But there's going to be a lot of, uh, be a bit of a waiting game. But I'm sure that this is, uh, these results are being rushed at the lab, yeah. but still we're only what two weeks, two and a half weeks out. It's, and our, even on a rush case, you're probably looking about another week and a half or so um, for, you know, sexual assault kits. Um, anything like we talked about is fingernail scrapings, uh, any biological material that may have been uh, on her in, in, in inappropriate places. Uh, Rosemary Romero, does the CEO or Joel ever get the press covering any of these heartbreaking criminal cases? Yes, I do. Um, I do, uh, especially when it's uh, it, it involves children. And, you know, I, I think I told you guys I covered the Sandy Hook elementary shooting when I was at Fox in New York City. Uh, horrific. I mean, news is made up. That's why people say don't watch the news. It's mostly mm -hmm. negative and uh, it does get to you. I think I've become so immune, though. That's the sad part. Um it's hard to like drum up emotion, but every once in a while, it definitely, uh, definitely uh, hits me. The COE wanted me to bring this up uh, too. Um, you love the show? Write a review and don't forget to give us five stars. You can listen on an Apple, Spotify, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Um, this goes such a long way to helping all of us. We'd really appreciate it uh, if you can give us uh, those five stars. I always get the bozos that give me one star and tell me I'm an idiot, which is fine. But if we get more five stars than one star idiots, then we'll be doing well. So please don't be a one star idiot. Be a five star star and give me five stars. Give the COE five stars. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, this is an interesting question. And uh, then we'll start to quickly wrap up here. Uh, do you think Maddie actually wrote that? I think they're talking about the going off into the woods. Maybe uh, I think that was written back a year or so ago so it probably was her but if it was done you know right after this alleged crime took place then i think there's a strong possibility maybe stefan stearns uh would have written that in order to uh place some sort of uh little i don't know idea in other people's heads but uh for those who do not know uh david nutting is a retired detective and cold case supervisor out of orange and volusia counties uh, in Orlando and uh, glad to have him back on the show again today. Uh, David, uh, are they going to get to the bottom of this case? And um, how long are we going to have to wait here? Uh, I don't think we're going to have to wait too long. Um, maybe not. You know, I, I, it's a, who, who knows? I don't, but I don't think it's going to be a, a very lengthy, lengthy wait, but they will. We will get answers. There's no doubt about it. Um, but uh, it, it may it may be surprising to some people what what those answers are. So uh, I think just just buckle up and let's see and let's see what happens. And David, final question: What's your gut tell you about the mom? Um, I uh, I just curious. By the way, shout out to Daddy Short Nuts. That's not 
his son gave him that name. Don't get crazy, everyone. His son <laughs> named him that. So I like that name. I wish my son called me Daddy Short Nuts. Um, my, my son, the other day, I mean, let me tell you something. I raise these kids well, but we're at a restaurant the other day. Suddenly my kid flips me the bird. I'm like, how do you even learn this? Where do you learn this stuff? They learn things at school. Anyway, I, I read him the riot act and uh, he thought it was hilarious. So uh, there you go. Um, <laughs> Daddy short nut says I am a five star idiot. Thank you, David, uh, for being there a five star idiot. And there's another five stars. Appreciate that. Um, what's your gut tell you about the mom, David? Uh, she, she, know, she knows more than she's she's got information. She knows more than what what she's uh, alleging. That's my gut. There you go. One tired mama. What is a COE? That's great. It's bigger than a bread box. No, um, that is the chief of everything. Uh, she's the wife. She uh, runs the show, literally and figuratively. Uh, she runs the show. She makes all the decisions. The seven o'clock will likely be a disaster because uh, she's off at a school play with the kiddos. <laughs> Fame Tallahassee defense attorney. Our Timothy Jansen, he's a partner in the firm Jansen and Davis. He's done everything under the sun as a lawyer. He also spent five years as a federal prosecutor. Legally speaking, we've got the arraignment, Tim, on April 2nd. Mm -hmm. um, do you think we see an arrest of the mother? Uh, what does your gut tell you about that? And what else do you want to add? I think he'll be charged with murder in two weeks. I think the mother may not be charged before he gets charged with the murder. Maybe afterwards, they still got forensics to do. They got to run some things down. Uh, her lawyer is probably trying to negotiate something, and they're probably not going to, the state's not going to negotiate anything until they get all the toxicology, the autopsy report, everything together so they don't give away the farm, right? You don't want to give away the farm if you don't have to. And they got him in jail with no bond, looking at mandatory life sentences, possible death as we, we sit. So I don't think it's going to be rushed, but I think it'll be done in a couple of weeks. He'll be charged with murder. Tim Jansen, you don't have to go to confession. You have nothing to confess. You're good. You're good. That, that's what I tell myself. <laughs> and then the priest, he looks at me when I come and just looks at me and shakes his head. Do they let Jewish guys in the confession? Can I, when I'm in Tallahassee, I need to go. I need to, I need I'll, to talk I'll tell you a funny thing at church. My kids said, don't sit in the front row. So I did. And we sat in the second row and they were so mad at me. So after church, the priest kept looking at me, and then I left, and it was right after I represented Jameis Winston. Mm. So I went to shake his hand, and he hugged me, and he said, good job. So I think he was an <laughs> FSU fan. You know, when the priest <laughs> hugs you, you know, good job. So I think he was a big FSU fan. Oh, that's awesome. There you go. Love it. Go Gators. Love you, America. There you go. Florida Gators, go Gators, go, uh, go Knowles, go Gators. I don't know what to do. I'm a Jersey guy, so I'll stay out of it. But uh, huge thanks to uh, Detective Nutting. Huge thanks to Tim Jansen. Love you, Orlando. Love you, Tallahassee. And, of course, justice for Madeline Soto. Hopefully I see all of you in uh, 26 minutes. We're talking Scott Peterson. See you in a little bit. 